1st, 2015, and to consider making the program permanent and granting the MRCA authority to manage the recreational zone for a five-year period. Terrific. Thank you. And we have two cards on this, and we're joined by uh, our colleague, Joe Buscano. Welcome, Joe. And uh, well, let's hear the card uh, comments first, first being Steve Appleton, followed by William Preston Bowling. Do I step up here? Yeah, please. Um, I'll just do it like this. Um, I just wanted to thank the committee for taking a look at this today. Um, we are at LA River Kayak Safari, which is partners with Friends of Los Angeles River on offering... Oh, thank you offering tours, uh, kayak tours on the LA River in the Elysian Valley area. And I just wanted to recognize some of our partners, folks from the Friends of the LA River who are our nonprofit partners and are real collaborators on this, the um, Mountains Recreation and Conservation Authority. We just really want to support this. We believe that the overwhelming benefits that have come from river recreation are not only for the whole region and the city, but it's also building stewards across the whole area. Uh, we are also very focused, as are our partners, in community benefits for locals. So, for instance, we do some local hiring within our community. We also make an effort to run community, free community paddle events with the Mountains Recreation and Conservation Authority um, and several other kinds of things. In particular, this year, we've emphasized hiring local youth and trying to build along a group of people that start to have the skills and knowledge to bring people out on the river who actually live there and, and gain job benefits from it. So we really do urge a uh, passage of this. Um, one of the values of extending into the October um, season, extending to October, is that LAUSD is out of session typically during the rec zone Memorial Day to Labor Day. So we get requests all the time to serve school groups that we're not able to deliver on. And, and our organization will take the position of trying to really emphasize and prioritize working with youth from schools, in particular the River School that is NELA local, Northeast Los Angeles local, and we can get those kids out there working with the educational program of FOLAR. Um, we ha we uh, really have been in a learning process, all of us over time, and I really want to thank the Chief Ranger for all the work that he's done and the whole MRCA. We do have a couple of issues that need to get sorted out on, on some changes in permitting. We're in conversation about that. I trust that will happen. Um, um, I, I hope that, you know, Council will urge that. And I thank you very much for the, the time to speak. Thank you, Steve. And it's a great organization. Um, and Steve is a great guide on the river, too, by the way. I, I just want to recognize Grove Pashley and, and Agnieszka, well. who have also been... Uh, really s the, the heads of this, this operation with me. They'll Thank take you. good care of you. They won't keep you from, you know, going in necessarily, unintentionally, but they will take good care of you. Can you paddle board on the river yet? Uh, I have now taken to doing some stand-up paddle board. We're not willing to put any patrons out there. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. But uh, with the right board. I think you have a taker right here. Yeah. We'll talk. <laughs> All right. And uh, next we have uh, William Preston Bowling. Hello, I'm William Preston Bowling. I'm Special Projects Manager at Friends of the Los Angeles River. And I brought with me uh, Sean Warren, and we're part of the Legislative Committee, and we're in support of the motion. And uh, we cleaned up uh, trash uh, in the Sepulveda Basin and uh, some parts of the San Fernando Valley with Fernando here at MRCA. And the dumpsters were overflowing. Uh, it was a success. And uh, I put some flyers back there for our cleanup. We're actually cleaning up the rec zone this Saturday. So if you guys can make it, there's some flyers back there, and we're in support of the motion. And, and thank you. Great. And how many years is, is the La, La, La Grande Limpieza? It's about 20? This is our 26 year 20 cleaning years. up trash in the LA River. So the Army Corps of Engineers built 1,500 miles of storm drains to get the water off the streets as quick as possible. And unfortunately, they drain into the LA River and Boyona Creek. So we clean up that trash before it hits the ocean and becomes part of that giant floating island of plastic. Mm -hmm. And uh, we hope to see you there on Saturday. Thank Wonderful. You. I certainly will. Um, all right, thank you. And that, that uh, concludes the public comment. And now I'd like to invite Mr. Fernando Gomez from the MRCA, another incredible guide, by the way, on the river. Uh, good, thank you so much, sir. Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone, as well. Again, Fernando Gomez with the uh, Mountains Recreation and Conservation Authority, the Chief Ranger. And uh, again, uh, MRCA has actually been blessed to actually be able to be appointed to the uh, recreation zone starting uh, when it first started uh, now four years ago out in the uh, Sepulveda Basin, really successful with the nonprofit organizations that we joined. And from there on, we've now opened up two recreation zones, which is, again, now extends from the Sepulveda Basin, two and a half miles, and to also the Elysian Valley, two and a half miles. We've worked where we, we 
continue to work with the organ, local organizations from Alley Conservation Corps, uh, full, Friends of the Alley River, um, Alley River Kayaks and Safari, Alley River Expeditions as well. Again, organizations who are local, who in, believe in this program, and again, who absolutely support the mission that both the, the city, the county, and the uh, Army Corps of Engineers have actually embraced. And that is one of the things that if we have been that ship and to make you know, the connectivity for everyone to enjoy, then you know what, that's great. Last year's uh, season, we ended up with at least doubling the participants with about 6,200 people who participated in the river, uh, doubled from the year prior to that. So that speaks a lot to this program and the continuing that they really want this local recreation in their backyards as opposed to driving miles and miles of which, which we all know within now, I mean, it's hard to even get around, even just to the local, you know, just local parks, let alone getting down to if you want to go kayaking or you want to enjoy a waterway. So again, having this in their backyard is a very big uh, opportunity for both Angelinos, for people who even come out from, from afar to come and see and kayak on the Alley River. So we are really, again, we're looking forward to this, uh, this motion going forward as well. Good stuff. So doubling in attendance year over year. Extending into October, are there associated, f there's an, a fee that, or a, a cost to that. So can you talk a little bit about about that? Yes. Uh, that one of the big things uh, for us to be able to uh, get this, uh, the, the third year, MRCA uh, pretty much took all the fee costs, uh, moving funds around in order to be able to get this uh, program going. We were, uh, we did get the sponsorship from both the uh, LA Department of Water and Power and Bureau of Sanitation uh, to help us uh, this, with this cost. This year, we're asking for the same support from the, both of those sponsorships. Uh, again, some of the fees that do acquire from this is like any other, managing any other parkland, and there's there at least some kind of uh, administrative uh, fees that goes into this. However, we are working to make this uh, affordable for anyone who the vendors who are participating to make sure that they're you know that they're actually going to be comfortable with that pricing as well. Terrific. And since this program is growing, um, how are we on the training and licensing? Because these are rapids. It is the river, and it is dangerous. Yeah. There's no question about it. But uh, it's uh, I've been very very pleased, just personal personal witness to the safety standards that have been in practice while kayaking at the river. But with increased use comes increased risk. Can you talk about that in terms of licensing for those the, the, the guides and what program exists so that we there's a certification, right. et cetera? Okay. Well, the, uh, the one guide, the, we do abide by the state fire marshal. So we do provide a uh, flat water, swift water type rescue for guided uh, um, guided. Uh, personnel is going to be doing that. We also have a provide an awareness level. Mm -hmm. Two different levels, two different certifications. Mm -hmm. uh, both of them could either be cited under the, under the uh, or can be issued under the uh, state fire marshal or equivalent. The equivalent part is that the MRCA would then certify those folks to still participate at no cost to the vendors for that certif certification. Mm -hmm. uh, this year we were trying to actually cut some of those costs for vendors to travel because some of these things have to be traveled out of state to be able to get the certification. Okay. And uh, so I, and I'll, I'll actually take this, I actually wanted to make this uh, less cost uh, for the vendors traveling wise. And unfortunately it's one of those things where there was a concern and uh, quickly uh, I'm taking that back and now we're going to be making everyone at least at a minimum to an awareness level, which we then still feel comfortable uh, having folks out there guiding and safely, they will have the same components uh, minus one item, which is an in-water safety, uh, kind of breaking away from your vest uh, component of it uh, and any uh, night operation, because they're not even going to be in a not night operation in there. That, so that's one of the key components. At awareness level, it still is a component that uh, no, you, can, you won't be able to obtain it anywhere else, I guess, unless you find a state fire marshal approved class up and down the state of California. So we are going to still maintain that integrity of the safety and the components of uh, the supplies that people need in order for them to go out from, you know, from radios to be able to get a hold of us, inexpensive radios that they can get them at local, local uh, sporting goods, mm -hmm. and be able to still make that communication with us when there's, uh, when there's that hazard, when they need that help, as opposed to creating a 911 call and being a burden to the city. It's a 911 system from either fire or, or PD. Our, our staff is being assigned specifically to the river uh, during the recreation zone. Okay, so anyone who's out there as a guide has a certification process that you're satisfied with, and anyone who doesn't have that level of certification is not permitted to be a guide. And that is correct. Okay, yeah. terrific. And, and we're working with all the vendors making sure that uh, this is going to be happening, and uh, the, the class is already coming up uh, in a couple of weeks. And, and lastly, what um, 
what's the chance of someday bringing that certification process to the LA River so that we don't have to travel out of state to get permitted? Is that any? Is there a likelihood of that happening? There can be, and uh, that would just again, it, it, there is a lot of components with it. Mm -hmm. We would have to work with even folks from the aqueduct to be able to get folks. We, with the whole component of that, we need a swift water portion of it. So there's got to be that little bit of moving water in order to get the certification to get to that state fire marshal. So, uh, and again, using the class here and putting them where our either partners from the Alley City Fire of Ventura mm -hmm. go to, it may be, again, it just may be not, not uh, something, that, an avenue that we definitely may need to uh, kind of uh, research okay. for local. Terrific. Thank you. Colleagues, any questions for Mr. Gomez? Uh, just a couple of questions. If you have 6,200 people, what the, what's the fee per individual? I don't know. We don't charge. The park does not charge a fee. Does anybody so that, get charged? Uh, I'm sure the vendors do charge. Uh, actually, vendors do charge for that, and yeah. they're here, so they can probably... Uh, well, uh, what's the fee? So there's a bit of a sliding scale. There's a lot of free community members. Right. Involved. You come up to the microphone, for the record. Yeah. For the record, you got to speak to the microphone. Sure. Judge Judy's going to come in here and get you. <laughs> um, the fees are somewhat of a sliding scale in right. that we oftentimes take locals for free or reduced cost. Right. The top end of it is around $75 in Elysian Valley, and I think the, the, the trip is shorter and less uh, difficult in Sepulveda, and it ranges, I think, around 65 or 70 something like that. I, I, I can't say All right, so let's say $70 times 5000 um, Right? Yeah. If, you, if, you, if you say 1,200 people go for free, I'm just throwing that out there. So, Chris, how much is that? Seventy dollars times five thousand, just so we get a rough idea. Calculator out. You know, three hundred fifty thousand. Three hundred fifty thousand dollars. No, no, seventy dollars. Yeah, yeah. Times five thousand. Three hundred fifty thousand. Well, you should have a better looking jacket on there, buddy. <laughs> Well, just I'm teasing you. I'm teasing you. I got it. I got it. Well, I don't know what it is, but the point I'm trying to make is <laughs> this is here, and it's so wonderful. And as a vendor, thank you. And, and as a ranger, thank you. And Mitchell Farrell, thank you. But I just want to make the point, this is what people want. They want real experiences. Mm -hmm. And being in the river is a real experience. So any way we can enhance this so the benefit goes to friends of Los Angeles River or schools along the way, I would suggest, because LA Unified starts in August now. So in August, and I don't know, uh, Madam CLA, put a, uh, uh, if we could. No, it's, I, think it's, I think it's earlier than that, Joe. Well, late August is still August. You know, so it's. You know, uh, that, that uh, but I'm just saying we should look to match our recreation needs uh, with the school session for the big public school system. But possibly, like with Sotomayor or Lincoln High School or Marshall High School or schools that are on the uh, area in the middle schools, you could have a day there where maybe you get a class of students there. And I'm sure all of us would be participatory in some way to help in the future there. We, we so, really, that yeah. is really the ambition yeah. of the October extension is to yeah. do that. Mm -hmm. But have them, have them commit as a school, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, and as they go forward and have them go to the River Center and learn about it, so it's almost like a lesson. And the other thing I did want to mention, I would hope in the future, not this year, and I hope I still have a voice next year somewhere in the world. I think you will, Tom. Uh, but I think there should be, from the great work that you have done, Mitch, uh, and I did a little of it too, in North Atwater Park, you should go from North Atwater Park to Las Feliz and then tour, you know, they and connect each cafe with it. I mean, there's so much to do. There is a perfect launching area yeah. from North Atwater Park, and we've had our eyes on it for years. We will yeah. get there, right? Look there, we'll get there, you know, which is good as we go forward. And I think it's just wonderful. And as I think of other districts around the city, bring them up because there is something very special. And we thank Lewis McAdams who was in the meeting in 1988. Were you born in 1988? Okay, Lewis was there. Okay, that's all right. In Mayor Bradley's office. That was the first river meeting that we had. So good enough. Thank you for what you do. Good job. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, gentlemen. And, and really, a shout out to Steve and Grove, because they are Elysian Valley residents who are mentoring Elysian Valley youth here, here. to right. bring them up to be river guides and you know, work and be employed over the summer and learn all about the river. Uh, hands-on experience, so it's a beautiful thing. So thank you for your mentoring.
All right. Thank you, Mr. Gomez. Thank you so much. Uh, any? I'm, I'm sorry. It, Curran? Uh, no. Okay. Joe? No. Okay. Terrific. So um, uh, we know we don't have rec and parks here, but what I'd like to do is just um, approve the motion and note in the motion that there is a 45-day report back from rec and parks on some of the details that we're still interested in, in buttoning up in terms of long-term funding, et cetera. So it's not a yearly uh, uh, ask so that we can establish that regular funding stream that may be a combination of different funding options uh, moving forward. So uh, without uh, objection, we, uh, we move uh, item four, uh, which brings us to item five. Item five is the Department of Cultural Affairs report relative to a request for retroactive approval to apply for and accept a grant to Bloomberg Philanthropies Public Art Challenge and to negotiate and execute agreements to commission temporary public art projects to implement the grant award. Terrific. Thank you. And we are joined by Daniel Brazell, Felicia Feiler, and Matthew Rudnick from Cultural Affairs today. And I understand uh, Felicia is going to expand a little on this. Uh, it's a very exciting proposal we have here uh, that's going to, um, you know, be very um, enriching culturally across the city. So please uh, tell us about it. Good afternoon. This is incredibly exciting. Um, as many of you uh, know by the, the, the way they teed up the transmittal, is we have an opportunity to, we are a finalist in the Bloomberg Public Art Challenge. Uh, back in November, uh, the mayor's office was invited to submit a proposal for a big and bold initiative, uh, uh, and we made it into the final round. There is now one, we're one of 12 cities that are in this final uh, competition. Um, and I think that what this project is hoping to do is galvanize the city of Los Angeles in a cultural initiative around water. Um, it will essentially uh, uh, create the first public art biennial uh, in Los Angeles, uh, anchored along the LA River. Um, but really what the idea would be is that it creates a whole new conversation about the role that water uh, plays in Los Angeles. And I think it creates an opportunity for us to uh, 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 reclaim the city as one city within one major public art festival, um, which is, uh, I think, what is, is what Felicia Feiler put forward in her idea to create Current, which is the name of the festival. A lot of metaphors flying around here. I love it. Right. Um, so what I'd like to do is just tee it up for Felicia to go into a little bit more detail, and we're happy to answer any questions that you have. Great. Great. Thank you, committee members. Um, ostensibly, as Danielle said, um, our aim is to create the first city citywide public art biennial. Um, which is uh, will be an art festival that will will commission. We hope to commission five large scale commissions, uh, five smaller scale commissions, and then five ancillary public art programs. And the idea is to talk about is to use this initiative to talk about the issues affect around water, and that could be from the drought to the effect on the ecology to the city's water systems, whatever um, sort of issues um, sort of present themselves around this initiative. Um, we are um, structuring the biennial uh, very differently for us. Uh, we think this, this initiative has the opportunity to create um, a new model for public art making in the city. Uh, we will be working with a curatorial team of arts professionals from area museums and independent curators. Uh, we will be a, um, developing um, a full-fleshed, uh, uh, fleshed-out um, social media campaign. We will be developing uh, an evaluation tool to, to measure the impacts, social and economic impacts of this initiative. And, um, and, and as Danielle said, while most of the works the artworks will be cited along the river. Um, in order to make the city wide, uh, we also will be looking at the, the parts of the city where the river does not run through it, but, it but, but those parts of the cities are equally affected by the conditions of water. So, so we have identified um, a site location in all the council districts. We have identified um, arts development fee funding as the match for this initiative, and um, this is the application that we submitted to Bloomberg, and we um, are very, we feel very strong that we'll be confident and successful in getting the, the uh, award. Terrific. Um, and can you talk about the, the costs uh, the, the, of the, the 
yes. amount in the, of the grant, et cetera? Yes. Um, the, we're asking for $955,000 from Bloomberg, and our match is roughly 1.3 uh, on top of that, so almost a little over 100% match. Mm -hmm. Um, and the city's funds will be used primarily to fund um, the artist commissions. That includes design, fabrication, and installation of the artworks. Mm -hmm. And then with Bloomberg's funding, we can um, be used to get some of these ancillary services that we haven't been able to use before, which is our curatorial services, which is you know marketing, communication, mm -hmm. uh, a technical producer, somebody who can help the artists, uh, you know, make their installations in these very sort of you know uh, non-traditional um, sort of environments. Uh, the evaluation method, et cetera. So we're going to use the Bloomberg's funds to um, to enable us to establish um, the foundational tools that we need to measure the, the, the program so that moving forward, because it is our aim, which is to have this sort of an issue every two years. Mm -hmm. So we can establish our metrics, we can establish, um, you know, our uh, the, the structure, we'll have, you know, a marketing tool, we'll have a brand pool, we'll have all of the sort of foundational needs um, developed so moving forward we can just concentrate on the uh, additional art commissions. And I love the idea of employing artists, offering commissions to artists in LA. Do you have a ballpark number of artists that will be, um, you know, uh, granted commissions and payment? Uh, we're looking initially at 15 uh -huh. artists, um, and but we Ironically, we're getting, or not ironically, surprisingly, we're getting a lot of interest in some additional funds. And so if we, you know, if we structure the budget correctly and if we get some additional funds, then we'll, we'll definitely throw them or direct those additional resources toward uh, more arts commissions. Terrific, terrific. And you mentioned uh, 15, basically a project in each council district sort of approach. And, you know, in, back in December through a 12-month period, we were able to update the arts development fee. And that was... I think we we really create a great template for that in terms of updating the guide or creating the guidelines, taking it around to each council office. So by the time it was teed up in December, we got a ten to zero vote and we freed up that you know frozen. Uh, um, yeah, exactly, and and so th that's a great thing, and we're on our way. And um, in terms of this going around uh, to all of our colleagues and kind of working with them in terms of what you've identified as possible projects in the districts. Right. So, um I, I would just say that I think that the um, the, the new guidelines and freeing up the ADF uh, uh, arts development fee resources has actually put us in a position to be competitive, and it is it does demonstrate a level of readiness. Um, we have had the opportunity to meet with members of this committee at this point. Um, this is a very fast-moving train, as you know. Right. The, we had less than, uh, I think, just about 30 days in, or, uh, in order to put the full application forward. Um, so we'll be circling back and working with um, various council offices to make sure that the, the, their contributions in this project make sense for their community. Terrific. I imagine something really fun at the port. Yes, with the waterfront. Yes. You know? Indeed. A lot of water. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Mm -hmm. we, we think that this is an important moment. You know, in, in, mm -hmm. on any given day in Los Angeles, there is mm -hmm. no shortage of creativity. Mm -hmm. um, there is no shortage of artists in our town. Mm -hmm. But there has yet to be a real <coughs> opportunity to galvanize an idea mm -hmm. that, um, that, is, that is both around a social issue Mm -hmm. using, I think, one of our greatest resources, which is creativity, mm -hmm. and to really think about the role that creativity plays sure. in changing awareness, changing behaviors, changing a value system. And in Los Angeles, we need to change the value system around water uh, in a major way. So we think this is a great timing for this, and we really um, encourage your support. And can you go over the timeline a little bit? So say we're, we're blessed, we get the grant, and, um, you know, it, it starts... It begins. Uh, when can the commissioning begin and when can the first projects begin going in? Sure. Um, the timeline is um, we will find out in probably mid to the end of May um, if we've received the awards. Um, our uh, strategy is to have our uh, technical team assembled, so that means the curators will be on board, PR firm on board, marketing team on board, education uh, or the, the uh, evaluation specialist on board by June mm -hmm. so that um, we will release the first wave of um, calls for projects in, in, in July. And then once the large commissions have been, uh, or the large artists have been identified, then we will issue a, a request for proposals. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, two requests for proposals, one for the smaller commissions in, in August and one for the, uh, the educational uh, materials also in August. And so the, com the curatorial committee will review 
uh, the, the proposals and, and criteria uh, over the month of September, October, and then, and then ideally have all of the uh, selected artists and programs assembled by <coughs> November. And then from there, we go through um, a series of permitting process from the uh, LA River Corporation, mm -hmm. uh, DWP, and Army Corps, mm -hmm. uh, a bunch of folks. Um, and the idea is to have all of the, the commissions uh, have completed their permitting process by the end of this calendar year so that they can begin moving into fabrication um, by the first of next year, so 2016. Um, along the way, we hope to engage, or we plan to engage the social media component and the educational specialists from the beginning so that they are there with us and with our curatorial team designing and, and refining and giving us some strategic direction in terms of how we roll the program out. So, um, so we envision this to be, um, we're not really sort of focusing on the end result, which is the artwork, the big reveal. Sure. But it's really about identifying the process and, and shedding light using social media and our marketing to sort of, to sort of sh present the process as it's unfolding and as it's being developed. Mm -hmm. And I would just add that the Team DCA has done an extraordinary job under Felicia Filer's leadership in really thinking through a very complicated and arduous and multi-city uh, de department um, workflow in order for this timeline to be successful. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, 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 it looks reasonable, doable. Um, it is going to be a heavy lift, but I think our department's ready for it. Mm -hmm. Sounds like it. That's great. And uh, tell us about the curatorial uh, commission. Is it something that exists now? Is, clearly there is a template that you follow with when you get, you know, grant funding for projects. Is, does this fit into that? Um, this is a little bit different. It's actually okay. new for us, for okay. public art. Typically for public art, we have a building that, that is assessed 1%, and then we issue a call for projects, and we get an artist, and the artist works with the architect and the community to sort of develop their project. With this project, we, are, um, we have a, uh, uh, brought on board um, a uh, uh, artistic director, Mark Pally, who's actually here and um, observing today. And, and then with Mark Pally's, uh, under his artistic direction, we, we have identified four curators, one from the L.A. County Museum of Art, uh, one from Otis College of Design, uh, from the uh, an independent curator, and then one from the Armory Center in, in Pasadena. So these curators all have experience in, in, uh, in working on biennials. Mm -hmm. They also have experience in sort of issue-based uh, public art making, um, social practice, you know, artists that have a social practice that are using sort of a process-based approach as opposed to an object-based approach mm -hmm. to making work. So this committee will basically um, create and establish the curatorial guidelines, sort of artistically, what are we trying to, what's, you know, what are the objectives, and then, and then from that information we will develop the call for projects so that the artists have something to respond to. So well thought out, thank you. Now, it, do you have any reason to believe that the arts development fee may not be able to be used for the match. Is there anything that leads you to believe that that is a possibility? I, I don't think so. We, you know, the fees that we've identified, we, we're taking a very conservative approach. Mm -hmm. and we've actually identified um, developments that happen along the river mm -hmm. and happen along the, um, the sort of main tributary so, and, and near the sort of bodies of water that, that we've identified. So mm -hmm. as long as we can make that, you know, that nexus, um, we understand you know, what the requirements are in terms of the, the city's legal requirements, I think we'll be okay. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, it's important for us as part of the arts development fee to make sure that the users of the developments have access to this project, and so by because we are taking a long lead time, we have the opportunity to engage the developers for the entire year in terms mm -hmm. of what's happening and make sure they they are aware of this program. Terrific! I hope this paves the way for a wonderful new template, if you will, for citywide art projects and installations, which uh, previously the guidelines would not have allowed for. So this is already the first result of that flexibility that was built into the update, and it's really a great thing. This is kind of a, I'll use another metaphor, a watershed moment <laughs> for arts in the river. Okay, I'm done. Okay, so uh, here's the thing. It's uh, uh, something that I, again, want to articulate to Mr. O'Farrell, Mr. Buscaino. Years ago, there was a very effective tool in here where there were groups of deputies who were appointed as art deputies from each office. Not everyone has an appointed art deputy. Is there a working group like that at all? Uh, the, uh, in my previous... Uh, no, no, I understand. No, no, but, but forget your previous. It, it is right. my understanding that we, 
we have a contact person in every one of the council offices that has a, a, a DCA. Responsibility. Exactly. Okay, so that what I would just suggest, Mr. Chair, yes, to strengthen that, and then also for you to call a meeting in this room or another room and have the deputies come and say, this is what needs to get done. We have a 15-car train, and sometimes the train gets slowed down because not everybody gets on the car. So I have a working group. Am I okay, Madam City Attorney, on this? Okay, but in order to be effective to meet your goals, I would suggest trying to reinstitute uh, through the committee chair to push the planning deputies of the city do that. The city attorneys, friends of the city attorney's office don't do that, but they make them smile. You understand what I'm saying? Copy that. Because I it's see. real key. Yes. And the only thing I want to leave on the table, the only piece of art that I want done is the cats to return to the river. The, 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 yeah. Well, not Leo. Leo did it. The original were a couple from... Uh, Burbank. Leo was uh, the one who painted some, but other artists could do it. But that's the only suggestion that I wanted to lay Thank on you. Counsel. Thank you, Mr. LeBond. Mr. Buscano? No, we're good. Um, all right, terrific. And we have no public comment um, on this. Seeing as we don't, then um, we will, without objection, we'll move this item forward. Fantastic. Thank we you promise so to keep you posted. Yeah. Good. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Give a list of that, of who you have, the art people. Give it to the chairman. I will. Thank you. And thank you for that suggestion. You got it. We Good to see you. Mm -hmm. oh, you got it. You got it. My number's going to still be there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, which takes us to item six. Item number six is a city administrative officer report relative to a request from the zoo department for authority to execute the proposed Fourth Amendment to the Memorandum of Understanding with the Greater Los Angeles Zoo Association for marketing, public relations, site rentals, and catered events. Wonderful. And we're joined by John Lewis and Janelle Irving and CAO's offices stepping forward. And also, Connie Morgan, if, if you uh, would um, please step forward as well. And Mr. Lewis, would you like to begin? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, and good afternoon, Ch Mr. Chair and council members. Good to see you all again. And uh, I think I'll start by uh, letting the CAO kind of give you a, a brief overview of what we're requesting and, and what their office uh, suggests. Okay. Good afternoon. Janelle Irving with the Office of the CAO. Pending before your committee today is the proposed Fourth Amendment to the Memorandum of Understanding between the Zoo Department and the Greater Los Angeles Zoo Association for Marketing, Public Relations, and Site Rentals and Catered Events. On September 23, 2014, the Council approved the Zoo's Business and Marketing Plan and ratified the Marketing MOU as amended by the Third Amendment. The term of the MOU is from July 1, 2013 to June 30, 2016. Subsequent to the approval of the Third Amendment, Glaza identified and implemented an additional revenue-generating strategy to meet the deliverables of the MOU. This marketing initiative utilizes the Zoo after normal operating hours as a venue for events known as nighttime ticketed events. The zoo and Glaza have reported that significant revenue has been received and generated from these events, including the first year of the LA Zoo Lights. The proposed Fourth Amendment will incorporate nighttime ticketed events as part of Glaza's annual marketing program and allow the net revenues received to be transferred to the Zoo Enterprise Trust Fund and to also be included in the Zoo and Glaza revenue sharing schedule. Implementation of the proposed Fourth Amendment will provide additional revenue of approximately $1.1 million to the Zoo Enterprise Trust Fund in fiscal year 2014-15 and potential additional revenue in fiscal year 2015-16. The proposed amendment does not extend the term of the MOU. Nighttime ticket events were not contemplated at the time the zoo submitted the business and marketing plan for council approval. As a result, an update to the plan is also required to incorporate the new marketing strategy and additional revenue opportunities. As such, our, rec our recommendations are as follows. One, approve the update to the zoo's business and marketing plan. And two, authorize the zoo director to execute the proposed fourth amendment to the MOU between the zoo and Glaza for marketing, public relations, site rentals, and catered events this time, I'm happy to answer any questions, or John Lewis might take it away. Yeah, John or Connie, if you'd like to expand or sure. add. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, this, um, 
this need really came forward uh, due to the successes that we've been having. I mean, uh, part of the business and marketing plan was in response to the council's request, if I can continue the metaphors, mm -hmm. to wean the zoo from the general fund support. <laughs> I won't go all the way. <laughs> uh, but we really have been looking for ways to save money and, and to make money at the zoo while we continue to, to strive to reach our mission to nurture wildlife and enrich the human experience. Uh, this event uh, is a good example of how this MOU is really working for us and for the city. Uh, we were able to hire the best. We were able to respond to the market that was uh, responding to the event. We were able to publicize it in an aggressive way, and as a result, uh, exceeded our projections by something like 70 percent uh, on this one event. Uh, we couldn't have done it without the help of CD4. Councilman LeBonge helped us seed this with uh, money from his council district fund. That got us started. We borrowed some of the DWP lights. We brought in a number of other lights and lasers and mm -hmm. animated uh, uh, illuminations. It really was a great event. And uh, we think it's a, a, an example, not only of the zoo lights bringing in more people and revenue, but it's an example of how we can respond to new opportunities at the zoo versus who comes to the zoo between 10 and 5 each day. Mm -hmm. So uh, it just seemed appropriate that we be able to count those funds and use those towards our goals uh, each year. So as the business climate changes, it gives us the flexibility to uh, adjust to that and continue to bring money in. So. That's uh, really the focus of trying to do this, the flexibility, uh, and to look for future opportunities. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Tony? Well, if we're talking specifically about zoo lights, um, I, I would say yes, absolutely. It was, it was, a, it was a way for us to uh, use a new uh, strategic way of boosting attendance to the zoo while we strive to build the, the brand over the long term, which is uh, an effort that we have undertaken, and I will ask Kate Hilliard in a moment if, to come up and talk about that. But um, Zoo Lights was, was really something, and it was a wonderful opportunity to work with our colleagues at the zoo to produce something um, that was very different for all of us. I would have to say it ran 36 nights from the day after Thanksgiving through the Sunday following New Year's Day, and if there was ever a let's put on a show moment at the zoo, this, this was it. Um, it was probably the largest production during my tenure um, of an event. We had been studying zoo lights at other zoos across the country, and we knew we wanted to take this on because it has such a strong potential to bring people to the zoo who've never walked through your doors. And as I'll show it you, it did bear out exactly that way. We were fortunate that our council member, uh, Mr. Lavange, had been urging us on um, for quite a long time to bring back some. Did I come up with the idea first? Yes, and okay. you did. Uh, I and the record um, be and the record been, <laughs> he had been That's one. urging us on. Um, we, we ourselves recognized that Los Angeles uh, zoo lights needed to be Los Angeles centric and Los Angeles quality. We sit in a, in a, in a city that, that demands the very best. Um, and uh, in keeping with our own zoo's vision for 2028 of levering the diverse resources of this city to be an innovator in our global zoo community, uh, we decided to hire out of the box on Zoo Lights. We hired Bionic League, which is the lighting team for Daft Punk. Hmm. Uh, they have lit projects for Nike and Target. Um, they worked with art director Greg Lacey. Um, together, the, that team, Bionic League and Art, uh, Greg Lacey, have uh, done the sets and lighting for Kanye West's Yeezus tour. Mm -hmm. uh, they were our designers, and they gave us a totally original take, a production that included horizontal as well as vertical designs, a zoo-themed storyline, traditional tree wraps, as well as lasers, 3D projections, and unusual and creative uses of materials. Um, if you went to the rainforest lily pad, for instance, you would have seen a frog, frogs sitting on the lily pads that were made out of used water bottles. And they were lit, and they were programmed um, with, uh, uh, with music as well. And I think that was a $30,000 package given to us by a firm in Germany. Um, we instituted a huge marketing campaign to push this program to, into the marketplace with TV, radio, bus backs, outdoor boards, street pole banners, 
in every council district and very, very heavy digital marketing, including the Times. We use targeted marketing to drill all the way down into some very specific popular Christmas tree light, lots. Um, this, in essence, was our first venture into new branding for the LA Zoo, and it was our first undertaking with our local, new local advertising agency. Um, for the first time out, we projected sales of 100,000 tickets for zoo lights, basing our projections on what other zoos in major markets had achieved in their first year. Instead, we had an early publicity push that we generated, that we uh, benefited from. It generated widespread awareness and spurred ticket sales um, prior to opening. The marketing campaign with aspirational branding caught the public's attention, and best yet, word of mouth, every promoter's dream spread across the region. We sold 177,000 tickets. Oh and to manage the crowds, we utilized time ticketing, permitting folks to purchase the experience for a specific time in the evening. In the end, paid admission revenue totaled $1.869 million, and with sponsorship, that revenue totaled over $2.2 million. Um, but what's important about it is 78% of the attendees had never been regular zoo purchasers. These are people who had not been to the zoo. That's exactly what we wanted out of this because we'll get them back. Um, these admission sales lifted all the boats at the zoo during this time frame. Food and retail concessions for zoo lights, which we expected to be 350000 came in at 770000 Catering for holiday parties constituted $100,000 of that income. We booked 15 private events for 20 to 500 people during that time frame, and that generated 58,000 in gross site rental income, which is an, also an important aspect of the marketing MOU. Um, so even our carousel revenue was two and a half times what we expected that month, mm. generating 22,300 carousel rides and 68,000 in gross sales. So. Um, What's next for Zoo Lights? Uh, I was asked the other day um, about that, and what I wanted to tell you was this was only our first outing, and it was not a full realization of what we really want to achieve. We're actually on a five-year plan. Um, by design, this first year had a limited footprint in the zoo, extending from the front entry to Zupenda Center. Um, over the next five years, we want to implement uh, different phases until we have a full and robust, hopefully a loop program around the zoo that can accommodate the large crowds. This coming year, we're going to be about filling in the experience with um, millions of sparkly LED lights between the large set pieces and adding a couple of large set pieces to it, more than likely into the children's zoo and down the walkway to the lair. So. Um, if is it possible to have Kate come and talk a little bit about the branding for the zoo? Sure, and and we can we can kind of start the the dialogue now. I just okay. want to, and she's Sorry, perfectly welcome. No, no, it's Connie. It's great to hear. So I just want to commend our colleague Tom LeBanche for his vision and leadership on this incredible new sort of game changing experience at the LA Zoo. It's you've added a hip factor that just wasn't there before. You mentioned Daft Punk. The zoo's got street cred now. Yeah. <laughs> right? So, no, that, that's, that's really kind of amazing. And um, just the fact that I think sometimes we don't mean to, but we, come, we become complacent about our own assets. Right? Of course the zoo has so much to offer after hours. Right? There's a whole new world of possibility for... Uh, you know, to, to um, honor the requirements in the, in the MOU uh, in, in terms of generating the income. Uh, so I, I love the inventive uh, approach to this. And, and I would also imagine that you mentioned 15 private parties. I imagine that, will, that demand will increase so as well. We're, we're already which could be to book one for this coming year. So that could be very lucrative as well in terms of generating uh, additional revenues for, for this asset. Okay. Terrific. Yeah. So, um, yep. Connie had asked me to bring along, as she mentioned, in 
October, we hired a new ad agency and media planning and buying agency. The old agency was um, based out of San Diego, and we just wanted to take a fresh look at everything as we came on board. And the very first assignment they had was Zoo Lights. And um, the brand positioning is natural fun, but within that is this studio quality execution sort of mandate that ties into our vision statement of leveraging the unique resources of L.A. Mm -hmm. So the very first um, piece that came out of it was, of course, this. If you drove around town, you oh, yeah. probably saw a bit of it. And, of course, this is just for zoo lights, but it's the tip of the iceberg in terms of moving forward and developing the brand more. Also at that time, we launched the campaign, The Reindeer Have Landed, mm -hmm. for Reindeer Romp, which is our, um, our daytime programming during um, I have, I have to jump in here because yeah. that one reminded me, if you are familiar with Vine, you know, the little six-second oh. videos that go on. Yeah. We had a six-second video of the reindeer chewing. It went viral. Oh, it, was, yeah. <laughs> it had like over a million. How many hits, views. John? You know what hit is? <laughs> over, How many hits, John? Over a million. Over wow. A million. Yeah. yeah. Just chew Who? It. You can't plan this stuff. <laughs> <No>. Okay. <Right. laughs> you just got to. That's content. You just got to put it out there and hope right. something sticks. Mm -hmm. So then, most recently on uh, late March, we launched our first big advertising effort for daytime attendance, and you may have heard or seen this campaign. Um, it's called. Meet the baby. Meet our baby. Mm. Oh. And it's all about leveraging, again, um, the great job the zoo is doing in creating a wonderful environment for our animals and sustaining populations and putting us squarely in the center of Los Angeles. So you'll see that the Griffith Observatory is here with our koala. And here nice. we've got the downtown oh. skyline. Oh, yeah. Vincent Thomas Bridge. <laughs> <laughs> and this, I think this I one has yeah. Griffith again. <laughs> so we're really wanting to Boy. elevate the brand to become this mm -hmm. must-do destination in L.A., mm -hmm. both for Los, you know, our, our residents, but also people outside of L.A. to think of the zoo mm -hmm. as a great destination. And along with this branding work, we have a new tagline, which is the Los Angeles Zoo. Inspired by nature, ruled by animals. Wow. Mm -hmm. So you'll be seeing that. In May, uh, we're launching our first sort of general awareness campaign um, about the experience of coming to the zoo and with a nod to our new Jaguar exhibit. Mm -hmm. so what else do I have? One more. That's it. There, then again, the reason I wanted to bring this is so that you could see that we, we know that branding is the long term issue daytime um, visitors to the zoo, the nighttime ticket events um, help us to, to feed that uh, as well, not only to bring people immediately, but to feed them into this, come back, enjoy the zoo, and to position the zoo in the long term in our community as something very special in L.A. For everyone, not mm -hmm. just for families. Right. That's cool. Terrific. And Mr. Buscano, you, yeah. you were about to... I, I'm just excited and inspired by the work that everyone's doing here. Um, reminds me of the work that's happening at the port. The, the port does a great job of moving goods and cargo, mm -hmm. but when it comes to programming our waterfront, we need some help. John, you do a great job of running a zoo, but when it comes to programming, you have Glaza to help. And it's a great partnership. I congratulate you. And... Um, just the other day, we were walking. We'd take her family walks along the water. And my eight-year-old daughter turns to me, and she says, remember when we stayed the night at the zoo? <laughs> and those were just, just family memories that you capture and you never forget. Is the camping still going on at the zoo? Okay, we haven't been back in a couple of years, but hopefully sometime this, this summer we, we return. But congratulations. We're inspired. I know there was, there was a lot of skepticism at first uh, with this partnership. And it's proved we're you know we're proved it's, you've proved to to those who had some doubts and have raised concerns about this partnership that it is possible and it is working along and and Tom I know before you land your plane this is one thing that uh, you're you're gonna knock your ship man <laughs> knock your ship <laughs> that's right um, congratulate um, our colleague Mr Labange for helping fund uh, this effort and uh, really thanks Tom for for your leadership I, on this I thank the twelve nine money. 
1290 money that was used. It sat there. It got a little interest because it sat there for two years. And I hope you kept the interest, John, for the interest of the zoo. So the, but your wonderful work, Connie, you have someone who's very special. This whole way that you put together, I hate to tell you that like by 10 o'clock this last Saturday, Madam City Attorney, the freeway sign said, traffic alert, zoo drive. People love the zoo. People come to the zoo. It provides an opportunity. Uh, for people by families to have an experience and the zoo light was a wonderful thing it was so exciting I came back many nights just to stand and talk to people I had no no one ever complained to me uh, and this was an offset of the original idea by our great friends of water and power had the lights that came overwhelmingly successful uh, and then it just was natural to get it back going again we had to wait until the water lines got built and uh, I'm just proud of all of you because this was something, as you said, that's the best thing. I got to remember what your daughter said. Gia. Yeah, Gia said, you know, about the camp. I mean, the whole thing in life is to remember certain things about your life experience, and that's what the city is all about. You know, the children do remember their experiences to the zoo and all that. So that's so wonderful all the way around. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Madam CEO. Did you get to the zoo lights? All right, give me the phone, Mr. Santana. Okay. <laughs> What's the name of the? Give her the night uh, off. The light okay. folks. <laughs> I want to get the information oh, of the name. Of, yeah, if you can get that in my. They should do that down at your place. Yep. You You're gonna bring that kind of credibility to the to the harbor. So I just want to say that uh, I also want to comment, commend the CAO's office for yeah. just the partnership uh, and and effectuating the you know the the goals and intent of the MOU. It's it's being done and it's it's like working in hand in hand and. Um, discovering this wonderful uh, and innovative revenue source and stream that's going to get better. It's going to improve even more. Um, and uh, just I want to commend all the parties for working so well together. And we, when you have the zoo and you have Glaza and the CAO and the city, and I mean, I think we're really on our way to that long-term healthy relationship that it's, it's really going to just... Um, uh, further establish the zoo as a world-class destination that it definitely deserves to be. So I want to commend everyone. And so having said that, how are, we, how are we doing in terms of the revenue now with this amendment to this? Um, how does it look in terms of... Well, with this amendment, it will bring us up just to where our projections were, so we should finish the year within budget. We're uh -huh. still running a hair below on okay. revenues. Attendance is, is up uh, slightly, but revenues are still dragging, daytime revenues, so mm -hmm. we're trying to fact in our uh, zoo staff meeting tomorrow, we'll be talking about attendance and revenue and trying to drill down on that. So. Terrific. Well, I also want to thank you for your Zoo Pals program. I was there on Friday with, yeah. with Alessandro Elementary School. They loved it. It was phenomenal. Taper Avenue, thank you. They love loved love that Sam program. Love and um, I would imagine that tells part of the story as well with all those kids just thrilled to be there and the teachers and the chaperones. It was quite a day. Very exciting. And I think that events like that um, and if there's greater awareness that that type of thing is happening uh, in the kickoff of spring and summer, then that, uh, you know, that could certainly help attendance as well, that, that awareness. So, But I think the, the council mm -hmm. must understand that this is a, mm -hmm. solely on their uh, responsibility. They're not like another department gets general funds. So this partnership is so important. I uh, move the report, so uh, move it. second and good. No objection. We're, we're on our way. It is moved. So th thank you so much, and congratulations, and, and onward with the zoo. I could real quick just thank your office, too, helping us, the CLA, everybody asking the tough questions that we need to answer to keep this thing transparent and answer all the questions. So thank you for that, too. You bet. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. O'Farrell, with your leadership. Oh, thanks. Thank, oh, you. thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, and that that uh, is the last item, and that concludes the meeting. This committee hearing is adjourned.